Hello, this is Pamela Smythe from Media Relations at the University of Waterloo. I'm one of the hosts of Beyond the Bulletin, the podcast that brings you news and views from the U Waterloo community. Please spread the word that we're on SoundCloud.com or wherever you get your podcasts. And now the interview from episode 124 of Beyond the Bulletin. Many view the first Earth Day in 1970 as the beginning of the modern environmental movement. In advance of Earth Day 2022, I spoke with Sarah Birch, a professor in Waterloo's Faculty of Environment and Canada Research Chair in Sustainability Governance and Innovation. We discuss Earth Day's relevance more than 50 years on and in light of the current climate crisis. Birch is Executive Director of Waterloo's Interdisciplinary Centre on Climate Change, and she is a lead author of the recently released report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the UN body that assesses the science related to our changing climate. Sarah, welcome. It's great to have you here. Thanks so much for having me. So the UN Climate Report stated that there has been a reduction in greenhouse gas emissions in some countries. That sounds like promising news. It is promising news for those countries. So there's two messages at play here that are really important to sort of hold in our mind at the same time. The first is that the global picture is that we've seen the largest average annual increase in greenhouse gas emissions that we've ever seen in human history. So globally, greenhouse gas emissions continue to go up. That's not good news. However, the flip side is that we're seeing real evidence for the first time of sustained greenhouse gas reductions in around 20 countries. So that, that those reductions are unfortunately swallowed up by the global increase, but they do show us that it's possible. They show us that, that good climate change decisions and policies are having a real effect and we have a template to follow. And these are industrialized countries, Germany, Japan, France, and even the U S that's right. Yeah. So in, in the, there's different reasons why emissions are going down in some countries. In the case of the U.S., it's largely attributable to moving away from coal, despite rhetoric from the, the Trump administration, right. for instance, that, uh, that coal wouldn't go away. That transition is already underfoot. In other countries, it's, you know, like Germany, there's been a really important push towards, um, towards renewable energy and building efficiency and vehicles and that sort of thing. So there's different reasons in each case, but collectively those are, you know, important examples of what to do next. Are you encouraged? I'm encouraged by that. Absolutely. You know, these aren't blips. These aren't aberrations. It's not noise. Um, it tells us that even more powerfully that the solutions are already available, which then puts the pressure on our decision makers to actually use them. Right. We have real evidence now for the first time of these sustained greenhouse gas reductions that show us perhaps a pathway forward. You know, there's different reasons for, for that progress in different countries, but in some cases, the reductions have been so significant and so prolonged that those countries are actually on track to limit warming to, you know, two degrees or less, which is what, you know, scientists are telling us would, would help us to avoid at least the worst impacts of climate change, not all impacts of climate change, but Mm -hmm. the worst ones, you know, there's been real policy choices uh, at multiple levels of government in these countries. However, we see countries like Canada and also countries with enormous populations, so what we typically call, you know, economies in transition, China and others, that um, where the emissions increases in those countries kind of swallow up the reductions that are happening in those 20 countries. So Canada's not doing well. Canada's not doing great. No. We, we have had a couple of decades of climate policies of various stripes. We've had targets uh, set over and over that we fail to meet. There is reason, though, to believe that the seeds are finally now being planted, however, for, you know, a, a turning of the curve of emissions in Canada. And it's a, it's tricky business in Canada for a couple of reasons. Of course, we are a fossil fuel producer. Not all countries in the world are. So we, you know, we're, we're very reliant on the extraction and the export of fossil fuels um, economically because of the, this sort of blessing and curse of, of space in Canada, our cities tend to sprawl over, over fairly vast distances. And so we've become very car reliant. It's, mm. it's really hard to densify them and get people out of cars in Canada. So there's lots of reasons for our high emissions um, per capita emissions in this country. 
What about Cole? Yeah, so Cole has to go. <laughs> the message is very, very clear. And there's a whole bunch of reasons why Cole has to go globally. And one of them is that it's just absolutely horrendous for air quality. Like it's directly responsible for an enormous amount of death and, and illness around the world. Um, and so that has been the major motivator for many countries getting off of coal, not climate change at all. Part of the solution to climate change is, uh, as some people say, electrifying everything. So we need to electrify our vehicles and our public transport systems. We need to get our houses off gas and onto heat pumps and other, other sources of power. So that only works if that electricity comes from clean sources. So if we're burning coal to get that electricity, you know, it won't be doing what we need it to do for greenhouse gas emissions. Um, you know, we have joined an alliance of countries, Canada has, in the Powering Past Coal uh, Coalition. And so, you know, there's real steps being taken to wean us off coal. Um, and that has to happen in like the next eight years. So essentially immediately to have any hope of keeping that 1.5 or 2 degree target within grasp. What about renewables? Are they just not attractive? They're increasingly attractive. Yeah. So another bit of good news from this uh, assessment report, which is really exciting and to me kind of indicates that the seeds have been planted for a longer term transformation, is that the cost of solar per unit over the last 10 years, it's gone down by 85%. Um, wind has gone down by 55%. Uh, lithium ion batteries, which, you know, as critics of renewable energy uh, never fail to point out the sun doesn't always shine and the, and the wind doesn't always blow, but that's why we have batteries and lithium ion batteries have come down by 85% and helps us bridge that gap. So they're now at scale and in many cases are even cheaper than fossil fuels. And of course, while there are downsides to all energy technologies, you still have to produce those solar panels and there are risks associated with that. Mm-hmm. On balance, you know, the risks associated with fossil fuels just absolutely um, overwhelm the, the impacts of, of renewables. Well, despite uh, the attraction, the price of renewables, we did hear news recently about the federal government just approving uh, Bay du Nord, a $12 billion offshore oil mega project. Do you think it's, a, it's possible for us to meet our commitments if we approve more extraction of fossil fuels? The uh, UN Climate Change Report says that before the end of the useful lifespan of fossil fuel infrastructure, we need to prematurely shut down definitely coal, but also oil and gas infrastructure. So that means that that infrastructure becomes a stranded asset, something we've invested in that we can no longer get value out of. Mm. So in the Canadian context, it's extremely, it's an extremely complex challenge that the prime minister and others have to face when they're deciding what energy projects can go forward. The Bay du Nord um, project is a lower carbon project. They're correct in saying that it's a, it's a lower carbon project overall than oil sands extraction in, in Alberta. And the reality is that our lives are still very reliant on fossil fuels. We can't, you know, yank the rug out from underneath Canadian and global society tomorrow, we would starve and not be able to heat our homes and move around. So they're not wrong that fossil fuels are needed in the short term. But my worry is that this will have a much shorter lifespan if we are to keep that 1.5 degree target um, in mind, that it won't be a wise investment at all 10 or 15 years from now. It'll extract 300 million barrels from the deep sea. And in order to keep operating, they will need to satisfy 137 conditions and one that the project have net zero emissions by 2050. Is that reassuring for you? It's absolutely an important part of the transition to move the emissions associated with the production of fossil fuels to net zero, which typically means through carbon capture and storage or carbon dioxide removal. Those technologies, however, are not yet being implemented anywhere near at the scale we would need to mitigate the the greenhouse gases uh, produced by these projects. But they are an important part at this point, because we've done such a poor job globally of actually reducing our greenhouse gas emissions, we're hearing more and more about carbon capture and storage and how important it is, because it's kind of like the Hail Mary pass at the end here. Mm. So um, that is somewhat somewhat reassuring. However, it doesn't account for the, those downstream emissions at consumption. So when we export those fossil fuels and they're burned and consumed by consumers like you and me, then those emissions need to be dealt with in some way as well. Right. Should we be hopeful? It's very easy to feel overwhelmed by the scale of this challenge. And it's, and it's fully appropriate to feel angry and to feel frustrated and to feel sad. Those are all 
completely reasonable reactions to this existential threat. However, I think the only thing that locks in failure is giving up. So when I see that renewable energy has come down so dramatically, when I see communities making real efforts to become more livable, to weave nature through cities, to get people out of cars and onto bikes, to consume less, to retrofit our homes so that they're more efficient, to just talk about climate change, you know, I'm hopeful that those are all reasons for me to believe that this is an incredibly complex long-term challenge. We will be decarbonizing for decades, decades. This isn't a quick turnaround. Um, But the path now is quite clear. And that's not something we could have said 15 years ago. This episode comes out on Earth Day 2022. It's a day when individuals show support for environmental protection. Why does it still matter when so many years after the very first Earth Day, which was 1970, we still have these problems, these serious problems that we're dealing with? Well, that we still have those serious problems suggests that it's, you know, to me that it's more needed than ever. This conversation is still vibrant. It's still challenging. We're adding new dimensions to it every year, every decade. Earth Day began as as a moment to reflect on the natural environment and the impacts that we are having on that. And the conversation was largely dominated by deforestation and species extinction and sort of those natural environment impacts for many decades. And those are no less important now. But what I appreciate about our conversation today is that we're starting to talk about all the important ways that climate change and other environmental problems like it are not simply environmental problems. They're people problems. They're social problems. And this is climate change is a, is a question of justice, marginalized people, um, indigenous populations, women, those who have tended to be without a voice in decision-making historically are also the most heavily impacted by, by climate change, by extreme weather events. And also may not be the first in line to benefit from a transition towards a renewable, you know, a low carbon resilient um, economy. So I think Earth Day gives us pause to think about how much a part of nature humans really are and to re-examine our relationship to nature and what it means to have a just and inclusive and sustainable society. The IPCC report kind of sets the stage for Earth Day as a moment of reflection on how far we've come and how far we need to go. What the the IPCC report demonstrates really powerfully is that the solutions that we need are already available and that this is now, and kind of always has been, but this is less of a technical problem, climate change, than a social and a political problem. And so Earth Day offers us this opportunity to have a conversation about the behaviors we need to change, the politics that we need to change, how much is it the responsibility of individuals to get us to to reach that target that is a 1.5 degrees Celsius target? This is such an important, I think, uh, relationship to explore. So, you know, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change tells us that individuals and individual choice controls, you know, 40 to 70 percent of our greenhouse gas emissions, which would on the surface suggest that it is entirely a matter of individual decisions, which is actually not at all what the report ultimately concludes. Hmm. It concludes that in many ways, our hands are tied as individuals. We're locked into high carbon ways of living because our cities are designed the way they are so that we have to drive, you know, these vast distances between affordable homes and our work. Um, because we don't have options for affordable electric vehicles or convenient or reliant mass, uh, you know, public transit mm-hmm. that's electrified, you know, that our buildings are built to a shoddy standard and, and wildly energy inefficient. So, It's actually collective decisions that are made by governments at all levels, from the municipal to the provincial and state on up to the national governments, that would unshackle us from those high carbon pathways and allow us to choose, kind of, you know, unleash the potential of individual choice. Politicians will only make policy on issues that they know to be priorities for their constituents, in a democracy at least. So when individuals demonstrate through their own actions that this is a matter of priority to them, when they vote, when they write letters, when they take the individual actions that are available to them, they send the signal that this is something that they're voting on, this is something that matters to them, and they are freeing politicians, they're giving them permission to lead and to then set the policies in place 
that would advance this even further. Individual action is incredibly important, not least because it's taking some power back into your own hands and feeling like, yes, I'm constrained in lots of ways, but these things I have a choice over. And so I'm going to make the changes I can and hopefully be a part of that greater groundswell. What's a way to engage individuals when maybe they feel it's futile? There are um, so many solutions available. It isn't about just one. So most people, not everyone, most people have access to a greater range of plant-based diet options, for instance. And this isn't about being extreme. This isn't about you know, uh, moving from, you know, zero to a hundred in a second. This is about gradually making choices to, you know, incorporate more plants into your diet or more locally grown food and this kind of thing to remove, you know, to reduce the carbon footprint of your diet. You know, it's not necessarily about buying a Tesla. It's about joining a car share program or walking once a week or carpooling with friends or, you know, working from home as we've learned to, um, through COVID. So, um, and same with building technologies. Of course, it helps when we have incentives available for retrofitting our homes. And, and that, that really is an important ingredient to reduce those, you know, upfront costs of making those changes. Um, but we do the little bits that we can. And the most important thing in my mind, because this is a collective action challenge, is voting and talking about it with other people. You know, sharing what we know and finding the places where our values align because I think we agree on a lot more than we disagree on um, in this space if we, if we just have the conversation. The theme of Earth Day 2022 is invest in our planet. Can we buy or spend our way out of this climate crisis? So we can't consume our way out of this crisis. And there are certainly a lot of consumer goods that are splashed with you know, claims to being carbon neutral or less environmentally harmful and this kind of thing. And that's, that's a whole marketing ploy. I do think though, that our IPCC report shows that we are underspending on this transition by 300 to 600%. So our, our investment, our finance, the flow of funds need to go up by a factor of three to six to really accelerate this change at the scale we need. And that's investment in renewable energy and in the, the technologies that you know, industrial processes, the vehicles, all of this that we need as part of the transition. So that kind of spending is absolutely crucial. And it's a huge justice issue because, of course, we know that the poorest countries globally are the hardest impacted also um, by climate change impacts and don't necessarily have the resources that they need to leap over this dirty phase of development towards a cleaner uh, renewable energy path. And that is a responsibility of wealthier industrialized nations like ours. Mm. What kind of reaction have you had to the report and the findings in the report? Yeah, so it's been a bit of a mixed reaction. Rightly so, our attention is quite focused on uh, the war and the atrocities unfolding in Ukraine, which has sparked a really important conversation about our reliance on fossil fuels and, mm -hmm. and the energy security benefits that we might find in transitioning away from those. The, the challenge is that we know with every successive intergovernmental panel and climate change report, the wording becomes more forceful and more pointed and more desperate, saying that, you know, this, this target of 1.5 degrees of warming or 2 degrees of warming is almost out of reach. And we have almost locked ourselves into a path where we will be, you know, having to withstand pretty uh, unfathomable climate change impacts for the next couple of decades. So the science is established. I think what is resonating in this cycle is just how much promise there is on the solution side, that we don't have to sit back and wait for some widget to be developed 30 years from now or to cross our fingers and maybe put blinds up in front of the sun, whatever. Anyway, these geoengineering solutions or other things, that the solutions are in hand and already rolling out. And, and so we just need to move faster. What does it mean for you to be part of this intergovernmental panel on climate change? It's an enormous honor, honestly. Um, you know, there's no scientific collaboration on earth like it. My chapter had 13 or 14 authors from 11 countries or 12 countries. Wow. We were from, you know, every chapter is like that. There's um, folks from all around the world with completely different sets of expertise, deeply interdisciplinary. You have economists and psychologists and development experts and sociologists. And, you know, you have the real gamut of 
scientists who are doing this voluntarily. They're nominated by their national government to uh, represent the country as a scientist on the IPCC, but it's voluntary. Um, it's an enormous labor of love over, over many years. You know, we reviewed over 18,000 scientific peer reviewed articles, um, over many rounds of review, we had to deal with 60,000 review comments and we have to respond to and account for every single one of them one by one, wow. um, to make sure that we're taking on board all of that, all of that critique and all of that additional evidence. So it's a remarkable collaboration. And it's also as a, as a transdisciplinary sustainability scientist, it's such a beautiful, illustration of science colliding with policy because what begins as a scientific process ultimately is woven into politics and you know national level and international treaty making and national level decision making and so that's a really incredible process to to witness what should people do when they were confronted with the findings and the recommendations and just feeling powerless what should they be doing you know, to frame it slightly differently, one thing that's been lacking is that we've, we've often been focusing on what we have to give up to deal with climate change, what we have to do without mm -hmm. and move away from. And there are lots of things we have to move away from, but we haven't explored enough or talked enough about what we're moving towards and what collectively motivates us. So it's that vision of a sustainable future. What does your neighborhood feel like? What is it? smell like? What is the, what, what does dinner taste like? How long do you have to spend in a car? You know, what is your job? How quickly can you get into nature? Does it take four hours to get to wilderness or is it woven through your city? How hopeful are you feeling about the path we're on and the future that we're creating for, for our children and our communities? So it's the, the vision of a sustainable future. And I'm strongly of the mind that there isn't only one, there are many, and it's really important to think about who is a part of that conversation, who gets to imagine um, where we're headed um, and then advance us along that process. And so that has to be a much, in my view, a much, much more inclusive and open conversation so that we can share our vision of what sustainable communities might look like. Let's think more about what we're gaining. I mean, you, so you got out of your car and, and onto your bike and now your physical health is better. Your mental health is better. You... Um, are sick less often. You might walk to work with friends and get more time with people that you love. Um, you might be eating more diverse and delicious foods. You might, um, you know, just spend less time commuting in general and more time doing things that you enjoy. You know, I think there's so many ways that dealing with climate change in a real, meaningful, thoughtful way can deliver such a long list of other benefits that we haven't even really fully considered if we do it right. Well, Sarah, thank you so much for being here and for doing this really important work. Thank you so much for having me. I've really enjoyed our conversation. Thank you for listening to this interview from the Beyond the Bulletin podcast from the University of Waterloo. To listen to all of episode 124 or indeed any others, look for Beyond the Bulletin podcast on soundcloud.com. Please join Brandon Sweet and me for new episodes on Fridays. And don't forget to tell your Waterloo connections about us.